going to look at uh, more involved applications using IR sensing and look at pulse oximetry as a case study. OK, so before uh, going into pulse oximetry, I am going to uh, basically recapitulate some of the things that we have uh, already seen in the past, in particular, uh, what is an uh, IR sensor or a photodiode. So we already uh, discussed this thing in the very first class or the second class, uh, where we have this IR uh, sensing system consisting of a photodiode. And what is a photodiode? What is the working principle of the photodiode? So the resistance of the photodiode, uh, as well as, of course, output voltage, that change in proportion to the intensity of the IR light received. OK, so if we uh, focus some amount of infrared energy on the photodiode based on how much is the energy, uh, that will modulate the voltage across the photodiode. That can be read using a microcontroller-based system, right? Uh, as we have already uh, discussed these things in detail. Okay, and uh, this IR uh, emitter could be on the system. Uh, it could be from a foreign object, or it could be also an artifact of the reflections, right? You might have reflectors around you, and uh, the IR emitters uh, emitted IR ray could be reflected from those obstacles, and then coming back to the photodiode, right? And we have looked at different applications of uh, this kind of a sensor, right? Uh, and this is how the system looked like. Uh, we were trying to monitor or uh, we are trying to understand the certain phenomenon in the environment or some kind of environment dynamics, right? So this is the phenomenon. we were trying to sense. And then we had this modality uh, uh, basically have some kind of sensing principles about why this uh, kind of a sensing might work in this context. right? So uh, you have to basically come up with an appropriate uh, modality to uh, understand or to tackle uh, the relevant sensing problem. So in our case, we looked at things like proximity detection. And proximity detection was a problem that could be tackled using this modality of sensing, right? So this is the principle of sensing. And in particular, we were using the IR sensors in this case. And how we were doing it? Basically, the sensor sends out the voltage as an analog input to the microcontroller-based uh, system, uh, which, again, digitizes it. Uh, uh, we have already seen how this entire pipeline works. Uh, and then based on the algorithm, you have to uh, process the data, right? process the digitized data, and uh, create an output based on whatever application you have in mind. Right? So this was roughly the flow of, uh, of the system. OK, and we have seen certain, we have already seen certain uh, simple uh, applications starting from uh, this moving uh, our hand on in front of the sensor and we were able to detect things like how fast uh, our hands were moving so that was something uh, in the temporal scale so in the in time how fast uh, the proximity of a certain object was changing uh, with respect to the ir sensor and then we were uh, not limited to that we also uh, showed you some more extensions some more interesting extensions uh, of the simple application where we try to build something like a step counter. Right? By the way, I did not uh, find anybody of you uh, taking this up seriously right? Uh, uh, as a project. So given that many of you are trying to do this IR-based uh, uh, tracking, right? this could be a nice thing to do as well. right? If you uh, complete this with an app, uh, all this kind of analytics, right? Uh, you can actually compare uh, by taking a ground truth as uh, as a camera feed, right? You can actually get uh, your activity recorded using a camera, and in parallel, you can also record it using the IR sensor, and then try to create some model, right? Based on uh, what activity you are doing, right? That can be a that can be a nice uh, project as well, right? I did not mention this in the project uh, list, but this is something that also you can uh, pick up. Okay, so 
uh, yeah, again, coming back to the discussion, uh, we looked at very simple applications, and then we are trying to look at something uh, which is pretty, uh, I would say, macroscopic, right? If you are uh, moving your hand or moving your legs, trying to do some step counting and all, uh, I would still say that uh, these are some something that is that can be very broadly uh, and very easily classified uh, using an IR sensor. And what we would look at today is something uh, which is much more than that. Uh, an example, for example, we are going to look at the problem of pulse oximetry, which is something uh, which sort of tracks the uh, concentration of oxygen in your blood, right? Uh, using the same IR sensor, right? but in a special way. Right, we are going to look at how those things can be done, what are the sensing principles behind them, and so on. Right. So by now, all of you are aware of this little device. Right. Uh, this was for all good and bad reasons alike. It is almost in every household nowadays. Right. And there are networked versions of this device as well, where the data can be pushed uh, to some uh, application. Right. If you uh, have an Android application that can be interfaced with uh, some of these devices that are Bluetooth enabled, and uh, some of the expensive ones also host such data in the cloud, right? Uh, all your health related information, your pulse rate, your uh, SpO2 count, and so on. Okay, so, but at heart, uh, the device uses uh, an IR based sensing mechanism that is something that we are interested uh, about right now. So, we'll try to understand how what is pulse oximetry and how exactly uh, it measures all these uh, parameters like your heart rate and uh, your blood oxygen saturation level and all okay so before uh, going into the mechanism first let's understand what exactly does uh, spo2 mean because that is the phenomenon or that is the metric that we are going to track using the uh, uh, using the system okay so uh, on the left, uh, I'm showing some blood samples, right? Uh, the top ones are a little bit dark and the bottom ones are a little bit lighter in shade. And we basically uh, show, uh, define SpO2 as the percentage of oxygenated hemoglobin in arterial blood. So this is very important, right? In this context, you have to know that uh, blood uh, flows through arteries and veins, right? And veins mostly carry uh, the deoxygenated blood that is something that is going to the uh, heart uh, right, for reoxygenation and all. So artery will, uh, we are mostly interested in arterial blood and uh, arterial blood is the sample that is shown on the uh, bottom side. So this is the venous blood. It is often when you go for a blood test, they will take some blood out of your veins and this mostly looks like uh, this dark colored thing, whereas the arterial blood is uh, this. And uh, there are uh, this thing called the amount of oxygen that is present uh, in the arterial blood. So this is a hypothetical example that I have put here. It never goes to 50%. This is like really, really low. But uh, you can assume that uh, the amount of uh, these red blood cells, uh, within that, how much of it has oxygen present in it, right, in the hemoglobin. So that percentage is roughly defined as the uh, as this metric called spo2 what the percentage of oxygenated hemoglobin okay so this is the concentration of oxygenated hemoglobin divided by the concentration of oxygenated hemoglobin plus the concentration of deoxygenated hemoglobin okay that is the ratio that we are trying to track and pulse oximetry that we are going to discuss today is a non invasive method for monitoring the person's oxygen saturation so uh, if you put an incision, right? If you put a needle and you are drawing blood out of uh, the person's body, these are invasive techniques, right? You are actually uh, interfering with the person's body or uh, getting access to the blood. Whereas we are trying to do something non invasive, right? We are not going to interfere with the blood stream per se. Whatever we are going to do is be will be uh, from outside the body. So, pulse oximetry is an example of non invasive method. Uh, for monitoring the person's oxygen saturation. Okay, and it has some, uh, it's the long history, right? Why uh, the, uh, the need of doing this non-invasive method 
uh, of monitoring was required right that has a history that goes back to the world war times right so uh, if you look at the pilot's face right it's not that they are very tense or something it's just that the oxygen concentration uh, in their blood has dropped drastically right uh, any idea why uh, this happens to these uh, pilots who tend to fly these fighter jets uh, because it is uh, gravitational pull sir and the low oxygen as they go no gravitational pull is always there g force this way sir yeah yeah so is g force is basically uh, because of the tremendous amount of acceleration right so uh they these are the training videos right some of these things are captured they will put them in a uh, centrifuge machine where they will create tremendous amount of g force uh, and that also happens in the uh, fighter jets right where they will take these maneuvers and this happens uh, to take a lot of blood out of the brain right and often there are during the world war times uh, lots of accidents happened because the pilots actually blacked out and uh, they they had no clue that how the plane has to be controlled and all I basically ended up in uh, having an accident right so there was a need from those times to continuously monitor uh, the blood oxygen level of the pilots right and while they are flying the aeroplane you cannot really uh, do anything that is invasive right uh, it has to be a continuous monitoring system and that pr preferably we will have to be uh non invasive for doing anything uh, practical okay so that is the necessity and that was also uh, the reason if you see all these fighter jet pilots they will have this oxygen uh, controlled and often it is based on the demand right of their body it how how much g force is there what is the oxygen concentration level of their blood based on that you can regulate the amount of uh, oxygen that actually is supplied to them and uh, based on this problem uh, the scientist called uh, glen milliken he came up with a device uh, which looks like this it can be fitted in your ears uh, and which what it will do is that it is going to uh, squeeze out a little bit of blood it is going to create a pressure uh, on your uh, on the skin of your ear and uh, and it is going to shine some kind of a light on top of that right so this is the first idea that came up uh, for doing non invasive pulse oximetry uh, which they called optical blood oxygen saturation method so this was using just an optical source it was using some form of a light that is going to be uh, shown on the squeezed blood uh, that is uh, that is done by pressurizing a part uh, of the uh yeah of your ear okay and this particular technique has become obsolete now but some of the principles still hold and uh, so he was the first person to uh, come up with this idea so he is the son if you don't know is the son of robert milliken uh, who is a nobel prize winner in physics right if all know about uh, milliken's oil drop experiment and what you see today uh, is the modern version which was developed by this japanese gentleman called uh, taku ayogi and this came a long way from the 1970s and if you see this has become almost like an iot device uh, today uh, which has its own bluetooth interface and it could be connected to an uh, smartphone application the data could be uploaded to the cloud and so on right but the principles uh, took some more time some a long time i would say to develop and mature right and still there are medical grade equipments which are more precise and of course there are equipments that are not medical grade of course the, you have to uh, compromise uh, in terms of accuracy but still they are pretty decent uh, to get a uh, good guess right whether there is an alarming situation or not at least that you can find out okay so now uh, we'll study what are the sensing principles uh, behind such a system and under the dotted line we are basically trying to map uh, it to the in the in the real system what you are going to do and right? based on the sensing principles we are going to implement some of the sensing algorithms so this is the system side okay so if we understand the uh, sensing principles then we'll basically see how to translate these principles into 
uh, algorithms that can be used to detect your heart rate or detect your SpO2 and so on. Similarly, we are going to look at the sensing modality, right? We need to look at uh, actual sensors, right? The principles are just the mathematical constructs, but from there we need to convert it into a real uh, system. So for that, we need to identify the modalities that will be used for doing such sensing operations and look at the hardware, look at the interfacing of this uh, sensing device with a microcontroller and so on, and then run the appropriate sensing algorithms and ultimately build some kind of an application. Right? So this will be the path that we are going to take in order to understand the end-to-end uh, -end system. Okay, And we'll start with the basic sensing principles that goes behind this. So uh, blood is basically some kind of a liquid, right? There is a solute and then there is a solvent, right? And uh, we are going to look at a mathematical or a physical principle uh, that captures uh, the amount of light or the amount of energy uh, that could pass through uh, such a solute, uh, such a solution, right? Uh, so uh, the model that we are going to follow here, suppose as shown in the picture, let's there be a column uh, of this solution that has that is of length L, and suppose I shine uh, some light source on top of that. Right, so we call this as the incident ray. So what will happen uh, to the ray that actually emerges? Uh, the intensity will be reduced, right? Because some of the intensity will be absorbed by the solution. And we are going to look at uh, how, on what factors that does that absor absorption depends on. And the emergent ray could be actually picked up uh, using a photodiode, right? The photodetector can tell you uh, that what is the intensity of the emerging ray okay and based on that uh, we can also know what was the fraction of the incident ray that was actually absorbed by the liquid uh, or the soli solution okay so what what we know here we know the length of the column or the length of the path through which the ray travels what is the intensity of the incident ray and we can measure the intensity of the emerging ray. Based on that, we can know that how much was absorbed. Okay. And what is the physical formulation for uh, doing this? There is a law called uh, Beer Lambert's law, which takes into account two things. Uh, one is the concentration of the solute, uh, denoted by C here. And the other thing is uh, this epsilon, which is the extinction coefficient. So there is a coefficient that is associated with this uh, solution and the uh, and the ray that we are uh, passing through the solution. So this is known as the extinction coefficient. So we will see that extinction coefficient is a function of what parameters and all. We'll see, uh, but uh, on the at the outset, right? The formula looks something like this. So I emerge is the intensity of the emergent ray is equal to the intensity of the incident ray i incident into e to the power l multiplied by c multiplied by epsilon where l is the length of the path through which the ray travels c is the concentration of the solute and epsilon is the extinction coefficient so now what we want to do is just replace the solution by blood sample that is our problem right we basically want to look at or analyze uh, some property of the blood sample right see uh, in the previous example uh, if we if we know uh, what is i incident right this is some uh, ray that you are uh, passing through the solution if you know what is i emerge right you you have some idea about the length right if you have a closed container uh, which is uh, holding the solution right then uh, if you put all these numbers right uh, you can have certain and you know the extinction coefficient also right this is a property of that particular thing right so in that case you can have some way to find out the concentration right there is at least you can sense that there is some way right uh, to figure out the concentration of a certain solute inside the uh, solution okay and the same principles will be applicable for blood as well right so it is basically replacing that particular solution using a blood sample where we do the same experiment 
uh, what is the experiment i put uh, the uh, i put an incident light source and uh, it goes through the blood sample and there is an emerging uh, light source that is captured by the photodiode and we do the exercise one again once again okay so now what we are interested in is basically the extinction coefficient so as i told you that this extinction coefficient is going to depend on uh, what solution uh, the ray is passing through and some properties of the uh, ray okay and we will see uh, in our context uh, what property we are interested in okay so it 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 mat uh, it turns out that uh, basically the extinction coefficient is a function of the wavelength of the incident ray right suppose uh, you are putting white light which actually is a combination of uh, many different uh, wavelengths or frequencies each one of this uh, incident light will be absorbed uh, differently and that absorption is a function of the wavelength of that particular light okay so if you are putting red light uh, through blood uh, the amount of uh, the energy that will be absorbed will be different if you put green light right so based on the wavelength the extinction coefficient will vary right and i have shown a plot this plot is not uh, quite uh, readable in the next slide i am going to uh, blow it up so if you see in the x axis i am showing wavelength and in the y axis i am showing absorption so if you see the amount and then rest of the thing are all the same right it's the same column of uh, solution it's the same solution uh, nothing changes in this equation right only thing that changes is lambda okay so this changes because we can put uh, different uh, wavelengths of light right and at the same intensity or the same energy okay so we can clearly see that there is a huge variation of that right and this will be somehow leveraged i'll explain in the next couple of slides uh, how this can be actually used in uh, picking up the intensity or picking up the concentration of oxygen okay so here uh, i am showing this uh, plot basically uh, these two are again blood samples but one is oxygenated one is deoxygenated uh, but see the absorption is a function of the light uh, or, or the wavelength right so the absorption is the function same thing that i am repeating uh, it's just that we are now seeing that it is a property of the wavelength lambda and number 1 and number 2 it's also a property of the solution okay so the solution concentration can change right if you have happen to have a different concentration uh, of course the absorption will change but uh, so i would rather say the solution's concentration if it is a different solution it's uh, of course you will have two different absorption versus lambda curves but even for the same solution um, if you happen to i mean let's say it is the same solution blood right whereas uh, two samples of blood might have two different uh, oxygen concentration levels so that will also impact this uh, particular plot right so in this case i am showing an example where i am shining one green light one yellow light and one red light and based on what is the lambda or what is the uh, wavelength of this particular lights you are going to see different kinds of uh, absorptions okay so now we are going to see more on the blood side right whereas we want to look at the concentration of oxygen in the blood what are the different properties of that and so on okay so now if you look at the left hand side figure uh this is the same uh, plot this is lambda versus the extinction coefficient uh, epsilon and we are having here two plots so the first plot is the blue one which is deoxygenated blood uh, this is the deoxygenated blood as marked in the figure and the red one is the oxygenated blood so technically speaking you can say these are like two different solutions right one has more oxygen in it and one does not have a lot of oxygen in it right and 
we are also seeing an interesting uh, two different wavelengths where one is red which is approximately in the 700 nanometer range and the other one is infrared which is in 900 nanometer range so the interesting observation is that the oxygenated hemoglobin absorbs more infrared light than red light okay so if you look at uh, oxygenated hemoglobin this is the red curve if you look at the infrared zone here right this is actually absorbing uh, more infrared light right the absorption is more than the deoxygenated blood whereas uh, on the in the other case here the deoxygenated hemoglobin absorbs more red light right so if you shift uh, to the red light frequency uh, the deoxygenated blood is going to have a higher absorption for red light right and if you look at the like difference right this is on uh, if you look at the scale it's almost uh, 10 times the difference okay so as you can see uh, in case of red and infrared uh, the condition completely flips right in one case the deoxygenated blood is going to absorb more red light whereas uh, in case of infrared the oxygenated blood is going to absorb more infrared light okay so this is something that will be used up in rest of our uh, analysis or, or rest of the uh, rest of the in building up the principles of sensing uh, for finding out the concentration of oxygenated blood right is, is there any question till here no question are you kind of following it so anyway i'll uh, quickly do a small recap again so we are trying to plot lambda which is the wavelength of the incident light versus the extinction coefficient epsilon okay and as i have seen i have already told you the we have this plot depends on two things one is what is the lambda that we are using and uh, the other thing is the concentration of the solute in the solution or the type of the solution okay and here we became more focused we are only looking at uh, blood and within blood there are like two categories of blood let's say one is oxygenated blood the blood that is rich in oxygenated hemoglobin and the other category of the solution is uh, deoxygenated hemoglobin uh, deoxygenated hemoglobin in the blood right so these are the two kinds of solutions that we are analyzing and for lambda we have chosen two lambdas one is lambda red right if you are uh, shining red light what happens and the other one is this lambda ir okay so what happens if you shine infrared light and the observation that we have made till now is the how much is the absorption in red scenario and infrared scenario we find out that in the red scenario the deoxygenated blood is going to be absorbed more whereas in case of the infrared scenario the oxygenated uh, blood will be absorbed more okay and the same beer lambert's law is going to hold in all such cases so uh, now what we are going to do is uh, going to have this provision of this uh, in the sensor we are going to have this uh, light sources right one is the infrared light and one is the red light so as you have seen in all these pulse oximeter devices once you put your finger in uh, you will see this bright red light uh, shine up uh, and that is basically passing uh, some amount of incident energy through your blood that will be picked up by a photodetector or a photodiode okay and the ir uh, led is um, thing you cannot really see with your uh, eyes but there are uh, two um, sources of incident energy one is the red one is from the red led and another one is from the infrared led and the photodiode is going to capture the emergent energy that is coming out from your finger okay and then apart from that uh, this will all be converted into digitized format it has to be communicated to the microcontroller for that you will have the electronics for adc and i square c bus for digital interfacing and so on Right, so this is how briefly the sensor looks like we are going to look at more details about what are inside this how you can program such sensor and so on uh, that we'll do in the next class okay now we'll focus more on the principles of sensing 
so uh, this is an abstract picture of the sensor where you have this configuration you put your finger inside the sensor and we have a provision for putting uh, these two leds here right that is emitting uh, light at two different wavelengths one is lambda red as i keep on saying and the other one is lambda ir right and the photodiode here is basically the detector right this is looking at how much energy is coming out uh, and being emitted from the other side of the finger after passing through the arterial blood stream here so you have the blood stream right inside your finger and the same holds for the infrared light as well okay we can somehow register the amount of energy that is coming out through the finger and that will be uh, evident from the voltage that we can see here okay and uh, next is how much it actually uh, whether it fluctuates you have to see that the amount of incident energy that is coming out of your finger also fluctuates with time so we'll see uh, when we keep on observing the voltage across the photo detector right uh, as we have seen earlier that if you simply do something like an analog read that we used to do right uh, as a result of the incident energy that is put in here and the emergent energy coming out if we keep on reading this value so we can keep track of the absorption that is taking place with respect to time and as you will see uh, if you actually happen to do this experiment a lot of absorption will happen uh, because of non pulsatile arterial blood because the blood is always present in, uh, in your finger right a certain fraction of blood uh, is always there it doesn't matter whether your heart is in the systolic cycle or diastolic cycle right so there is a constant amount of blood that will always be there so you can't do much about it there will not be any difference in the absorption the absorption will be constant right for most of the uh, most of these cases right and then there is there are more factors to it uh, there is venous blood uh, which doesn't uh, change a whole lot uh, with the systolic and diastolic cycles uh, and then there will be some absorption because of the skin and the tissue right so all of this is going to contribute to the absorption of both the ir uh, light as well as the red light from the red led okay and then on top of this there will be a little bit of variation which will be because of the pulsatile arterial blood right so after taking care of all these things then still your heart will be uh, pumping blood uh, right uh, through the arteries and because of that there will be a little fluctuation uh, in the concentration of the solution in this case the concentration of the arterial blood and that is going to be picked up by the photo detector or the photodiode because your concentration of the uh, components in your blood changes in particular we are looking at oxygenated hemoglobin and because of the change in that concentration level your your beer lambert's law is going to uh, be in uh, in action and you will see a different value of absorption and that will have a very much periodic nature as you are uh, seeing in the picture based on the activity of your heart the, if your heart is pumping the blood out you will probably see more oxygen levels and on the other cycle it is going you are going to see a little bit less uh, compared to what you have seen when it was fully oxygenated right so what we uh, see here is almost 98% of this change is uh, constant right on 98% of the absorption is constant whereas only 2% of it uh, will probably change right and that also has a lot of noise there right so you see that how sensitive the device has to be in order to capture uh, the small change in the uh, pulsatile arterial blood right and this now becomes like an algorithmic problem right we have the formula here the physical uh, basis of creating this system understanding the beer lambert law uh, we know that we can shine uh, this different uh, incident energies and based on the characteristics of the solution a little uh, the the energy that is going to emerge from the solution will be different so uh, knowing all these things still uh, if you happen to do uh, this experiment right uh, 
passing the red and infrared light through your finger you will see a little only a very little part of the emerging ray is going to the emergent rays energy is going to change and that is approximately 2% so what we call um, the constant part is the dc component whereas our concentration will mostly be on the ac component right so ac component is basically the alternating component or the fluctuating component so as your heart basically pumps blood out of it there will be an exact replica uh, of the heart's movement in your in the ac component that we are going to see right and that can have a direct uh, indication of your heart rate so if you can find out uh, this simple uh, this 2% change right whatever is happening on the top because of the pulsatile arterial blood because of the heart's pumping even if you have to happen to have this time series uh, you can uh, theoretically find out the heart rate right uh, what is the bits per minute uh, that your heart is uh, beating at right and there are like lots of algorithms for doing this right uh, in in reality the time series does not look as clean that i have shown here uh, even there are like so many startups which are still filing patents on this problem this is not a easy problem uh, and uh, based on the modality that you are using how cheap uh, modality you are using it's of course not a medical grade equipment this is something uh, which is commercially available uh, as a non medical device as well but still they will do a very decent job if you look at at least the heart rate estimation right and algorithmically this might be challenging and this has to do with uh, the peaks right wherever you are finding a peak and wherever you are finding a trough right so how many times uh, does this peaks and troughs occur within a period of 1 minute is basically your heart rate right and uh, there is no one algorithm that works in all cases but uh, for a decent uh, performance any sort of uh, peak detection algorithms work right Uh, but once you make it very specific to human heart there are lots of local maximums and local minimums uh, that makes the problem very challenging right and you have to do it at real time and not you will not see a lot of samples because nobody will expect to read the data for 1 minute and give out an answer so you have to do it uh, at a uh, in in a much lesser time window as possible right so this is something i can give you more reference notes and you can look at the state of the art peak detection algorithms on uh, for operating on such time series data right so uh, and also i'll give you some homework exercises as you will uh, see right which which will sort of you will you will actually get to see uh, such peaks and troughs uh, on your own right so now coming back to the problem of uh, computing spo2 let's say c o is the concentration of the oxygenated hemoglobin blood whereas c r is i call it reduced so this is basically deoxygenated or reduced okay and we have other two cases where in both the cases either we can shine a red light or we can shine an ir light so these are the four cases that are possible i can put lambda red through oxygenated blood or i can put lambda red through deoxygenated blood so these are the two cases uh, one and two and then the other thing is i can put uh, lambda ir so i can put ir light through either oxygenated blood or deoxygenated blood so these are the four things that are possible okay now let's say i am uh, putting uh, lambda red or lambda red uh, or red light uh, through my uh, through my finger so what will be the uh, beer lambert's uh, equation if we actually expand for both the cases we will see something like this right there will be both in different points in time there will be both uh, oxygenated hemoglobin blood as well as deoxygenated hemoglobin blood or reduced so if you put an incident energy of uh, i in one i in one that is this i1 is going to some, um, come out right and this will be uh, a function of what this will be a function of the extinction coefficient epsilon 0 as a function of the lambda red in both the cases as well as 
the concentration of the oxygenated hemoglobin blood as well as the concentration of the deoxygenated hemoglobin blood. And the same thing is going to hold for the other part wherever we are trying to uh, shine an infrared light, right? This is the case number two where I am basically putting an IR uh, light with an intensity of I in two. Okay. Any questions still here? Okay. So uh, again, we are putting, we are having two light sources with two different wavelengths. One is lambda red, one is lambda IR, and we are having uh, it passed through our finger, and the finger contains uh, a combination of oxygenated hemoglobin blood, and sometimes it is deoxygenated. It will, of course, change uh, as a result of your pumping heart, right? And what we are getting is uh, the incident energy, uh, the emergent energy that is coming out and being detected by the photo detector. So we are basically getting I1 or I2 based on whether we are shining red light or whether we are shining IR light. Right? So I1 and I2 are the two intensities we are actually receiving through the photodiode. So this is I1 and this is I2. This is also I1. So basically, we are looking at a combination of both. Right? This I1, I would say this is I1A and this is I1B. We are just having a mix of both of them because the C0 and CR, a CO and CR is not something that is in our control. Right? So we are basically getting a mix of both the things. Okay. Now, what we are doing is basically trying to come up with an estimation of the SpO2. Okay, so these are the two equations that we have already seen, right? And now there is a ratio R. You can actually uh, see how uh, basically it can be computed. Basically, taking this log to get rid of this uh, E, it is sometimes done as a 10 to the power minus L. Also, it could be done as e to the power minus L. It's basically to get rid of the logarithm. May different uh, vendors will do it in a different way. So this is the formulation that I have taken from the sensor Maxim Integrated. They are pretty well known uh, ma manufacturers of uh, this SPO2 uh, compute uh, SPO2 chip, right? So the R is the ratio, uh, this pulse oximeter ratio, which is basically a logarithm of I1 by divided by I in one. So this is something that is received at the photodiode. And I1 is something that you are controlling, right? This is the incident ray. So this is the intensity that is you are sending from the red LED. Okay, whereas uh, the other thing is for the infrared side. So this is also done using the photodiode. This is going to pick up the intensity of the uh, emergent infrared light. And this is the incident IR energy. Okay, and now uh, this is basically our analytical model, which says that SpO2 is a function like this: uh, a multiplied by r uh, square plus b into r plus c, where a, b, and c are parameters that has to be fit. Right? It ha you have to basically do a fitting of this particular car based on training data. Right. And many vendors do it in many different ways. They might have different equations. Uh, they will basically collect a lot of uh, SPO2 measurements, and that could be used. Uh, that could be using invasive techniques because that is the ground truth. And using that ground truth, we are trying to fit a model. And for that, we are trying to estimate these parameters a, b, and c. Okay. And of most of the times, these are all uh, statically uh, put. Uh, right in your system, uh, that is your calibration model. And many of the vendors will put all these calibration models for that particular uh, chip, right, available in public. So if you are writing software using these chips, you will basically, uh, you need not uh, redo this calibration process because it's a fairly expensive process. And they will uh, put the calibration files in public domain. So you can actually look at the values of A, B, and C. And often they are a function of temperature and all. For that, they will mention at what temperature the SpO2 is measured. So often these chips will also contain a temperature sensing uh, sensor. Okay. 
so this is how you basically have an analytical model ready where r is measured from your system and we want to basically map the spo2 to this particular equation ar square plus br plus c okay and for that we also have to do a calibration so this is this is the calibration that is done by the vendor which maps the r value uh, to an spo2 value which will help you in finding out the values of a b and c okay and r is something that you can calculate so this is the basically the ac component whereas this is the dc component right so this is the minimum value of red and uh, that will be pretty much uh, not changing and so the max minus this particular component is basically the ac component okay and we are going to take a ratio of both of them one in case of the red light and the other one in case of the ir light okay so once you know the value of r from your system the calibration file is going to give you a mapping from r to spo2 based on that you can find out abc so if in case you don't have an exhaustive uh, calibration you just have the values of a b and c in that case also after finding out the value after finding out this r you can actually plug in the values of a b and c and get the result right uh, you can basically if you know these values you can directly use them in your microcontroller to figure out what is the value of spo2 right? otherwise this will this might be very costly in terms of your uh, memory resources right if you actually have a huge huge calibration file stored as a part of your application uh, this might waste a lot of your resources so sometimes people will just find out the uh, fitting parameters and put them uh, in your application code okay so uh, if you look at just the theoretical model uh, there will be certain uh, differences uh, once you uh, do a uh, uh, completely empirical evaluation so that is based on a table lookup for every value of r if you look at uh, the value of spo2 it might not exactly follow uh, the fitted curve so there will be minor differences in between them uh, but we are going to basically minimize this gap right using the right parameters of the right model and uh, there is also another case of the simplicity of the model uh, this model has to be as simple as possible right if it is a very complicated model uh, and uh, that cannot be easily evaluated in the resources that you might have in a, a cheap microcontroller right so often uh, this data has to be put on uh, to a more resourceful system and the data has to be analyzed that often happens in case of medical grade equipments in those cases you will basically look at the r and then the entire calibration will be stored in some uh, better computer which is going to figure out the value of spo2 okay and uh, there is a lot of chance that uh, the value that you are actually getting here uh, could be erroneous if this calibration is wrong and one example uh, that came out in news right last year was uh, even if you put a pencil instead of your finger inside the pulse oximeter it is still detecting a heartbeat right uh, so you have to be very careful how you basically uh, design these algorithms right even the peak detection algorithm that i was talking about uh, could be erroneous right there could be always noise spikes right which will uh, make a false positive uh, guess that there is a heartbeat right sometimes uh, because of the ambient light because you have uh, the fluorescent uh, lights at your house that can be on right which will also have a frequency of 50 hertz right for that you might even pick up noise uh, which you can confuse with a heartbeat right so you have to very care carefully design the peak detection algorithms the peak detection algorithm for heart rate computation okay so this is very important so now uh, we are this is the principles of sensing uh, whatever we have discussed till now uh, and we are going to look at the implementation of uh, this particular a device in this case we are using this max uh, 301 uh, sensor maxim integrated sensor and trying to uh, interface that with a microcontroller 
so we will see how to do all those things what are the uh, what are the different registers that are available uh, inside the sensor and we are not going to look at the nitty gritty details of uh, every register because uh, you can have any any uh, such sensor we are just going to look at the principles how the i square c bus is integrated uh, to your microcontroller how the data communication starts uh, what are the algorithms for getting uh, real time data how to transfer the data let's say to through the serial port to a computer for visualization and so on so these are the things that we are going to discuss and apart from that so that we are going to do next uh, class uh, whereas today we are going to look at one more modality uh, using the smartphone uh, how we can actually do a fairly similar thing right so this was also proposed in uh, one or two projects Uh, where we are not using infrared light but just using the flash light that is available in a smartphone camera right and one common application is doing the heart rate detection and you will actually find lots of different applications so last year we did a big survey of uh, in the homo uh, that how many such applications are there in the market and what are their pros and cons right so all of these Uh, different applications the health domain applications will in some form of the other uh, going to do the same uh, achieve the same functionality some of them do try to find out the spo2 value whereas most of them will be just finding out the value of your heart rate right and they will vary if you see uh, how how robust each and individual apps are you can actually download some of them and you will see a fairly different performance under different conditions right if you happen to move your hand some of the applications are better whereas uh, some applications are going to completely give you erroneous values uh, if you are exposing your hand to too much sunlight right if you are trying to do the measurement in bright sunlight some of the applications will not work well right so there are minor differences in their implementation of the algorithm that sets apart one algorithm or one app from the other right and this is a nice exercise that some of the students uh, did uh, last time as a part of their homework right this is a small portion uh, right and i can share you uh, some of these uh, the different popular applications uh, that we found out last time okay so this method right the optical uh, method for finding out the blood intensity level uh, this is known as the photoplethysmography okay so in short we call it ppg okay so what we were doing earlier was using a standard set of sensors the using the infrared light as well as the red light and we are using a photodiode to actually look at the uh, emergent uh, lights intensity right and based on that we were trying to find out the variation of intensity from where we find out the heart rate right we are trying to track the variation of intensity or the variation of the absorption that was taking place and this was helping us to find out the individual bits right and this was constituting of the heart beat okay and the problem here is uh, we are trying to repeat the same thing but that uh, can we do it just using a smartphone and approximate the whole process okay of course the performance is not going to be any close to a medical grade equipment but again we are already declaring that we are trying to do an approximation of the whole process so we need two things one is uh, the light source and the other one is the camera right so we don't have ir led or red led instead of that we are just using a white light the light source we don't have a photodiode right we don't have a photodiode here we are just using the phone's camera okay so we are basically approximating the whole process here right so pick up the intensity of the light after it passes through the blood medium uh, finger right so if you actually place the finger in front of your uh, camera in the smartphone and simultaneously turn on the flash uh, the record you can actually look at the uh, if you look at the video of that that i'm going to share uh, that could be used to figure out all these different health related parameters 
right in 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 particular uh, in particular the heart rate and the spo2 and there are lots of applications that actually use this principle uh, to figure out your heart rate right so this is what i call smartphone based ppg okay you just you can use the term for ppg instead of this photoplethysis tomography and uh, as you see on the right hand side uh, you can track your heart rate pretty easily right and then you can do a whole bunch of analytics on top of that whether the rhythm is irregular whether the rhythm is regular and then uh, you can involve medical experts uh, they they can comment more on uh, what is expected what is normal what is abnormal and based on this you can also detect a lot of uh, different elements and so on right as an initial indicator right and of course if you want to do a proper diagnosis uh, then you have to use a use an ecg machine right so here we are just uh, short changing an expensive ecg machine uh, using a smartphone okay so now i am going to show you an actual video uh, if you actually put your hand on top of the smartphone camera turning on the flashlight so i have recorded this and in response of your heart movement uh, the intensity of the uh, intensity of this particular frame will change right and i have specifically marked one portion of the screen using the yellow uh, square or the yellow rectangle uh, if you concentrate on the yellow rectangle you can see minor differences because of the heart's movement so i am going to play the video i don't know through this online mode whether uh, the minor differences will be visible to your naked eyes uh, but i'll anyway uh, play this so if you look very carefully in that particular yellow uh, rectangle you can see the minor differences because of pumping heart okay so was it uh, visible to any of you yes sir yes okay. sir okay so uh, so this is just a video that i recorded uh, right using my uh, finger and the smartphone and now what was happening is that for people who did not notice the minor differences you can always uh, feed this video to a computer program and then actually look at what was the intensity value uh, that was uh, actually being displayed so you will see uh, two types of uh, intensities in the frames right sometimes it gets darker and sometimes it is lighter right and the temporal variation is something that we want to pick up right that is going to give you an indication of uh, whether uh there was a systolic cycle or there was a diastolic cycle so based on that you can find out how many times the cycles were taking place and that is going to directly give you an approximate idea of your uh, heart rate right this is the principle on which all these applications are based on it is just that how smartly you are handling noise there will be lots of noise because of your hands movement there will be light that will be coming from different sides how you uh, make your algorithm better to reject those kind of noises uh, that is that is how your algorithm is better than compared to the, your competitors right so you will basically see these two types of frames uh, on an average uh, successively and this indicates your systolic and diastolic cycles respectively okay and if you for people who are uh, not very familiar to how to deal with such images in a computer so this is every frame that is being shown in this video this is basically a two dimensional array of uh, pixels right and every pixel here so uh, if you are recording it using a resolution of let's say uh, 480 pixels in the x direction and then say let's say 360 pixels in the y direction so you will have 360 multiplied by 480 pixels and every pixel will be a collection of these three numbers one is the intensity of a red light one is the intensity of green light 
and the other one is the blue okay so of course red is high because uh, this is primarily a red picture and all these values right will be like these three numbers and then for this entire picture you will have a two dimensional array of this uh, this three tuple right these three numbers right? that is how we represent uh, a, an image frame and for your ppg also uh, in the video that you are going to record uh, using this phone camera this is also every frame is basically nothing but this uh, x cross y x pixels by y pixel this matrix okay so and you will have multiple uh, numbers of them right based on how many you are collecting per second so often we collect uh, these videos at 30 frames per second right 30 frames per second which means that in one second you are basically going to have 30 of these matrices right is it clear so in one second you are going to have 30 of these frames and each frame constitutes of this x cross y pixels where one pixel is represented by this tuple right and uh, you we are basically interested in finding out the variation of intensity right the intensity of this uh, entire frame changes with time and we are interested how it changes with time so that we can figure out what is the heart rate okay so i'll show you one example of this uh, that one one of the video was collected uh, in normal conditions where as the other video was collected after uh, i do an exercise right you do some push ups and also that your heart rate increases and because of that uh, the the temporal variation of the intensity is also going to increase and that will be picked up very easily uh, using the phone camera right using this ppg analysis and here i am showing this is i did not put any axis per se this is time this is the time window right and then on the y axis i have the intensity okay so this could be an average intensity i am plotting only one number so so every number here represents one frame right that changes with time because once you get a peak this means that the intensity was very high right and once you get a trough which means that the intensity was uh, low right now we will see that how this particular thing changes with time so if you see uh, on the top you can see the camera output on the bottom side you are basically seeing the time series okay and if you see in case of exercise uh, the number of uh, beats per unit time was more compared to the normal case the normal scenario if you see there is a beat so there are actually many bits right and your algorithm's job is to actually figure out the location of these bits right whereas in case of the normal scenario for the same time uh, window right we are having far lesser number of bits Any questions from here? Did you understand uh, what was going on both in case of while using the IR and combination of the infrared light as well as the red light? Whereas here we are doing a very uh, cheap approximation of that particular hardware. We are just simply using the phone's camera and the flashlight uh, in order to pick up the emergent intensity uh, from the finger and using some kind of data mining on top of that kind of uh, the, the video or this time series data uh, to figure out uh, the bits per second so from here you can very easily figure out the bits per minute sorry in for heart we basically look at the bpm and the task would be to uh, figure out how many local uh, this maximas or minimas you have okay so i will uh, put this entire story right uh, for the smartphone based ppg as a homework problem uh, which i also uh, did in the last semester so there will be minor variations but it will pretty much be the same and it will be based on the story that i uh, told you right now and your task would primarily be to analyze uh, these uh, video traces 
collecting it yourself and then trying to do this data mining on top of this time series data to figure out the bits per minute and then look at minor variations like what happens if the resolution of the video changes right suppose uh, you what is the impact of the resolution of the video right do, do you require a high resolution video to do this exercise probably not right what is the impact of the frames per second do you re really require a lot of frames per second uh, input uh, in order to figure out the bits per minute uh, correctly right so some minor things that we are going to look at uh, which is going to give you a pretty good idea about what kind of uh, camera or what kind of uh, image quality is enough uh, for doing this ppg measurement accurately okay okay so uh, i will stop here so the next class i am going to look at uh, the implementation right we are going to go back to the original pulse oximeter device uh, that we understood the principles of and now we are going to look at how we can interface uh, such a device uh, to a microcontroller right and we took a small detour that how we can achieve the same task uh, approximately the same task uh, using a smartphone based uh, application uh, just using the flashlight and then camera right and this is something that you would be trying out uh, as a homework problem and if you are interested i will i am going to also give you some ideas if you want to continue this as a project uh, that also i have some pointers in the uh, project list right if you want to find out the value of spo2 uh, from such ppg application or your uh, blood pressure from this uh, ppg application that is also something uh, that is very interesting and uh, lots of research is also being done uh, on this kind of applications right particularly think about the crisis that we had uh, during the during the pandemic right a few months back even these pulse oximeters were very rare it was not being available in the market very easily and people were easily uh, charging things like 2000 rupees 3000 rupees for this simple device right even if we have a very simple crude approximation using a smartphone things could have changed uh, drastically right so this could be a real uh, contribution right if you can manage some sophisticated uh, model to figure out the spo2 using this ppg intensity frames that would be a very nice contribution from your end okay.